Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome everybody to the Cannabis Regulatory Commission's public meeting on this February 24th. Um, the time is now 1.08 by my clock and I'm calling this meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Hogan, please read the notice of the public meeting. Madam Chairwoman, this is a meeting of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in accordance with the Senator Byron M. Baer Open Public Meetings Act. The meeting was noticed in the Asbury Park Press, Atlantic City Express, Bergen Record, Courier Post, and Trenton Times in December 2021. Information regarding the virtual nature of this meeting due to the COVID-19 pandemic was posted in publications and on the CRC website. The meeting time and location has also been posted on the website of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission and with the Office of the Secretary of State. Thank you. Um, can Ms. Hogan, can you please take roll call? Commissioner Barker. Present. Commissioner Del Cid Coso. Present. Vice Chair Delgado. Present. Commissioner Nash. Present. Chairwoman Wayne. Present. All members of the commission are present and we now have a quorum. The first order of business is for the commission to go into executive session to discuss legal matters and litigation updates. These are discussions that are not shared with the public. We believe the executive session should take about 30 minutes. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? I move that we go into executive session, Madam Chairwoman. Moved I second by, it. Moved by Vice Chair Delgado, seconded by Commissioner Barker. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing none, all those in favor of going into executive session, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. The commission will now go into executive session. Uh, we expect the executive session to last approximately 30 minutes. We will leave the live stream running during that time and we'll return to the executive session uh, once the executive session is done. Uh, so we can expect to resume the public open portion at about 1.40 p.m. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you everyone for your patience. The executive session has ended. Uh, it is now 1.42 by my watch and we will now resume the open public portion of this meeting. Ms. Hogan, can you please announce the next agenda item? The next item on today's agenda is approving the minutes of both the commission's open session and executive sessions held on January 27th, 2022. The minutes have been shared and reviewed by the members of the commission prior to this meeting. Thank you. If there are no questions or um, uh, corrections to the minutes, I will ask for a motion to adopt the meeting minutes for January 27th, 2022. So moved, Madam Chair. Moved by Commissioner Delcoso and seconded by Commissioner Nash. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the January 27 minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed to approving the minutes, say nay. Are there any abstentions? The ayes have it and the motion is carried. Next up on the agenda is the chair's report. Thank you. Um, I first want to begin our my chair's report today um, with a heartfelt uh, 
thank you to Ms. Erin Hogan, who, uh, for whom this is her last CRC uh, public board meeting with us um, as Erin prepares to move on to bigger and better things. Um, we are so thankful to her for all of the work that she has put in to help the CRC um, stand up as an agency and be the success that it is, uh, with particular emphasis on you know, helping with the um, uh, helping us get through the public meetings. Um, so I want to uh, extend a warm welcome, I'm sorry, a warm thank you and well wishes for Erin as she uh, moves on um, to the next journey. And uh, thank you, Erin, for all, everything that you've done for the CRC. I'll thank next you. turn to um, provide a few updates on um, the CRC's process and expectations. Um, I've been concerned that some people have, uh, we have received incoming from several folks who um, may be jumping the gun a little bit with respect to what they think will be outcomes of this new industry instead of waiting for the established processes to be completed. Uh, and so we have thousands of viewers who have tuned in to this commission's public meetings over the last 10 months. And anyone who's been paying attention knows that the commission has been uh, very, pretty transparent about the application and investigation process, both with, as it pertains to the medicinal and the adult use industries, as well as what people should expect in the future. Uh, so for example, the CRC has met with dedicated partners who have invited us to meet with or have accepted our invitations to meet with them and have been tremendously helpful in informing our rules and sharing information with the public who want to be a part of this industry. So for example, we have held several meetings with legacy operators, um, both nationally and um, at the state level to talk about how best to support um, those in the legacy market who want to transition into the regulated space. We met with veterans groups and municipal officials who've been uh, wonderful partners in sharing information with the CRC about what's happening on the ground and also sharing out CRC information to their constituencies. So I thank all of the CRC's supportive partners for, for their help in this work. Um, in you know, in August of 2021, the CRC put our initial rules into place. And those rules put a strong focus on providing meaningful opportunities for people to own and operate a cannabis business. And we were able to do that with fees that are among the lowest in the country and priority application review for people with prior cannabis related convictions certified minority women and disabled veteran owned businesses and people living in economically disadvantaged areas. In October, we hosted a statewide informational webinar um, to make people aware of the rules and what they can do uh, to start preparing for applications. And then in the next month in November, we hosted another pre-application webinar to dive a little bit deeper into the application process um, and provided a number of resources for those who want to participate in this industry. The, the CRC has set out our vision for an equitable cannabis industry. We want to see New Jersey's industry reflect the diversity of our state. We want to see racial and ethnic inclusion among our business owners and workforce. We want to see businesses small, medium, and large. And we want to see businesses spread out across the state from Cape May County to the far reaches of the Delaware Water Gap. But in order for that vision to come to fruition, we need all of you. Uh, we have more than 300 uh, participants watching this meeting and we need each and every one of you to help us bring that, to, that vision to reality. We want aspiring entrepreneurs to picture themselves in New Jersey's cannabis industry. Um, so if you are inter interested in operating a cannabis business, please go to our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis to learn more and to apply for a license. And we also need our stakeholders 
to help share information, the available information with community members. So we really look forward to continuing the CRC's work with our trusted partners and stakeholders uh, because we want to ensure that our helpful resources reach anyone who wishes to be a part of our garden state. Um, and so with that, I will uh, conclude the chair's report. Um, and I'm very excited to see um, our industry grow as we move forward in New Jersey. And I will turn it back to Ms. Hogan. Firstly, I just want to thank the chairwoman for your kind remarks. Um, next up on the agenda is the executive director's report. Madam Chair, may I have the, have the floor? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I would like to also echo uh, our chair's uh, comments and thanking uh, Ms. Hogan for her service to uh, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission and, and uh, her broader service to the, to the state of New Jersey. So thank you. Um, so uh, gonna cover uh, a, a number of things that we've been covering consistently in the executive director's report, um, at, you know, echoing the uh, chair Wainu's comments. Um, we want to be transparent about our application process and provide updates as to where we stand so that people who are uh, either waiting uh, to have their applications uh, voted on at a commission meeting or, or otherwise uh, have a good idea for where we are. So uh, please go to the next slide with the, uh, with the agenda. So going to cover an update on cultivator and manufacturer application acceptance, update on the 2019 RFA awards. Um, touch on where we stand with the expanded ATC certifications. Uh, and then I want to cover uh, just some follow up on uh, the interim lab testing change uh, that was uh, that the commission voted on and, and approved uh, last meeting. So uh, before I get to the, the application update, uh, echoing our chair's comments, you know, one of the we really stand at a, at a crossroads here, uh, an important one. And we've been at many at the commission. You know, one was when the law was signed. Uh, one was when the commission was formed in April uh, of uh, 2021. Uh, another was in August when we, when we did our rules. Uh, and here we are, you know, moving through hundreds of applications, uh, ready to really kick off uh, this legalized market under an entirely new framework. One that uh, did not exist before, did not exist in medical cannabis. Uh, and I can tell you, somebody who came from the Department of Health, uh, who oversaw the division, that you know we learned a lot of what to do, but we also learned a, not, a lot of what not to do, uh, and we learned from not only our own experience but from other states. Uh, and you know we've been getting some, we get questions to our licensing mailbox, and I want to just encourage everybody who's interested in getting into this industry uh, to look at the resources on our website. Uh, our director of communications, our director of uh, our office of diversity and inclusion, uh, they've and other staff members have just done a tremendous job at putting resources on the website that are uh, available for would-be business owners uh, to learn how to get into this industry, uh, to learn how to start a micro business, to learn how to apply for a conditional uh, application, how to convert from a conditional application to an annual application. Uh, watch the two webinars that our chair mentioned because there's really important information in there. And one of the things that we've highlighted, and we still get questions on this, is we have completely cast aside the RFA process in our new licensing system. We are moving through applications on a rolling basis, but according to priority. Um, conditional applicants, that's applicants that have uh, that meet certain income thresholds and other requirements, uh, get reviewed first and foremost, and social equity business applications get reviewed at the top of the heap. Um, and those are applications that are either uh, submitted by individuals with past cannabis convictions or who live and have lived in economically disadvantaged areas around the state uh, for you know five of the last 10 years and currently uh, have uh, meet certain income uh, thresholds. You know, our goal there is to really provide a very targeted approach uh, and provide priority access uh, to this new industry. Um, so, um, it, you know, when looking at where we stand, uh, we are making tremendous progress. If you go to the next slide here. Next one, thank you. 
So one of the things I covered in the pre-application webinar uh, is that uh, initially with uh, these applications, uh, we anticipate that we'll need uh, more than 90 days to review. Now, uh, for those who submitted on December 15th of 2021, you know, that 90 day clock is coming up on, on March 15th uh, of 2022. Um, our goal is to, is to get as close as we can by that 90 day clock and eventually to beat that 90 day clock uh, on, on new applications. But just given the volume and the fact that we're still staffing up the agency, um, in, in the pre-application webinar, I covered that we will likely need extra, uh, need to extend that 90 day uh, clock in the early days due to volume. The components of the application review are the submission review and scoring. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here, as I mentioned, that we're what we're doing is dramatically different than uh, RFAs that occurred in, in the medical program is uh, we're going to allow applicants to essentially cure their application. Uh, this is this is a new feature. It's in our rules. Um, so in a big competitive process, you know, it's it, you have to follow strict standards here. Uh, because we're doing a rolling basis and we're looking at each individual application, we can reject an application back to an applicant. They can then cure, resubmit with whatever deficient uh, information wasn't there in the initial round. And depending on what priority level they were, um, they won't go right to the front of the line, but they'll go to that same priority level. So if you're a social equity business, uh, micro business, uh, conditional applicant, that's the highest overall priority. If your application is deficient and you get it back because of a, some deficient factor, when you resubmit, you don't go to the back of the line. You go just go to the back of the the you know highest overall priority. Similarly, for other social equity business applicants and diversely owned businesses and so on and so forth. Um, the other components to the review are, are criminal history, qualification, investigation, and, and, and probity. Um, that is different depending on whether you're a conditional applicant or a annual applicant. Um, a review for regulatory compliance, and then uh, a recommendation for the commission uh, to, the, to the commission from staff, and then uh, the, the commission would, would vote on it. Um, if approved for a conditional licensee, they would get that license uh, and then uh, have uh, a certain amount of time to convert to uh, annual. And if it's an annual application, though, then uh, essentially then the build out of the facility starts and uh, the license is only issued once a, a facility is built out and ready to start actually producing, uh, manufacturing or selling uh, cannabis. Um, next slide, please. You know, I mentioned that the criminal history background check component, that is a very targeted and very uh, different look in recreational uh, cannabis versus what was in medical. Uh, there's only, uh, you know, uh, it's the statute is very clear uh, that uh, a disqualifying conviction has to be directly related to the business. It doesn't include past cannabis convictions. As I mentioned, that, that in fact is... Uh, uh, those can benefit applicants, uh, depending on uh, whether they're a social equity business or not. Um, and then there's a review is for the statutory compliance with social equity businesses, impact zone business, diversely owned businesses, which includes minority business enterprises, women owned business enterprises, and uh, disabled veteran owned business enterprises, um, as well as uh, compliance with the other uh, types of uh, applications. Uh, importantly, we're also looking at compliance uh, with our uh, regulations, which are, uh, I can tell you, have had other states reach out to, to find out about, uh, get more info on our, our regulations on uh, management services agreements and financial source agreements, which uh, are there to protect social equity businesses, to protect minority business enterprises, women-owned business enterprises, and disabled veteran-owned business enterprises from predatory contracts and, and predatory uh, business practices. Next slide, please. So all that is, is going on in, in the review process and uh, providing an update that I've updated provided before, this is where we currently stand in, in the breakdown between conditional and annual. Still, the majority of applications we have are conditional, 86.5% uh, versus 13.5% uh, annual. Next slide, please. For application types, uh, still roughly... Uh, a close to a two-thirds, one-third split between cultivation and manufacturing with a few uh, testing laboratory applications, uh, as well as uh, some others, uh, some other applications. Uh, those are mainly types that we're not accepting applications for at this time. Next slide, please. The breakdown for the different designations, and these are only at what the uh, applicants attested to. Um, so, uh, 
for social equity applications out of the 363 we currently have, it's 127, 175 diversely owned business applications, 37 impact zone applications, nine with bonus points, either for collective bargaining agreements or uh, residency, and then 15 that just uh, applied in the general pool uh, of applications. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the last thing I wanna say on the cultivation and manufacturing is that you know, we hope to have uh, some very positive updates in, in the near future here when it comes to those applications. As I said, 90 days is uh, March 15th. Uh, and uh, you know, I anticipate that uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll come close to that on some of these, um, but uh, eventually we're gonna be beating that 90 day mark. I can, I can commit to that, especially on the, uh, on the conditional applications. Um, we have had some applicants ask about uh, how to get updates on their applications. They can actually get those in the system. If it says they're under review, then they're in fact under review. Uh, so now I'll turn to the RFA updates and, and run through this. Uh, next slide, please. So we have 43 awardees uh, and I'll get to why that is. Uh, you know, we had 44, we now have 43. I'll talk to that, uh, talk to that in a second. Uh, all, all 43 are in the investigatory, investigatory stage of permitting. Importantly, none no permits have been issued. Uh, they have awards and awards are conditional uh, and they're conditional upon meeting all the requirements that this commission put into the final agency decisions to ensure accountability, to ensure compliance with our regulations. Um, this investigation includes verification of the information supplied in the application, uh, criminal history background checks, uh, and verification of compliance with all those conditions in the, in the final agency decisions. Next slide, please. Um, so we've dropped from 44 to 43 because one dispensary awardee has not accepted uh, the award. Um, and so that award has been turned returned back to the com commission. Um, it is a dispensary in the southern region. Um, and that uh, award is, is uh, returned to the commission and, uh, and for, to all the commission members, I would anticipate uh, a recommendation forthcoming on uh, from staff on, on what to do with that. Next slide, please. So we've received a lot of questions about certification specifically and, and the certification status of, uh, of applicants. And so we wanted to provide uh, an overview of, uh, of where things stand uh, as it pertains to uh, either M minority business enterprise certifications, women-owned business enterprise certifications, uh, or veteran-owned uh, certifications, which we're all scored on in this uh, RFA. Uh, and in fact, of the 43 accepted awardees, um, it, you know, either based on actual certification status or what they've uh, attested to in their application, um, there are uh, 19 WBEs, uh, 11 uh, MBEs, and 11 MWBEs. So of those uh, 43, uh, roughly 22 uh, are uh, either minority women business enterprises or minority business enterprises. And importantly, that there are several uh, you know, races and ethnicities that can get you qualification for, for that. Uh, and then uh, 19 are uh, WB or women uh, owned business enterprises. And this is all being verified. Uh, importantly, there are applicants who uh, did not have a, a, a certification at the time of award and therefore were not uh, scored it, it, as having one. Uh, uh, who are still remain in process uh, for that certification. So uh, we will continue to report data on awardees as it becomes uh, verified and available. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So moving now to uh, expanded ATC certifications and you can go to the, the next slide, thank you. Um, so once again, quick to review, you know, the, the way the law is set up, uh, existing alternative treatment centers do not need to go through a formal application process to begin recreational sales. Uh, ATCs just need to prove they have adequate supply to serve patients and recreational consumers, prove they can expand to recreational dispensing without impacting uh, service to patients, uh, submit proof of municipal uh, approval for the licenses sought, um, and uh, some other requirements that are in our regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, eight certifications have been received and are under review. Uh, I can report versus last, uh, um, versus last meeting. Now five uh, have been deemed complete and have moved on to sub substantive review for those factors uh, in regulation. Uh, the three that were, were still deemed uh, not to be complete, that the reasons have been communicated to the alternative treatment centers uh, and we're working with them to uh, get those uh, remediated uh, quickly. Next, next slide, please. 
Um, so I hope to have further updates on on that uh, at the, you know certainly uh, at our next meeting uh, and and on an ongoing basis. Uh, so now uh, we have received some feedback uh, based uh, and some questions about the uh, interim lab testing standard cha uh, changes that were adopted by the commission last week, and that really was simply to um, it, allow for using the Maryland uh, standards, and you can go to the next slide, please, uh, to up the uh, batch size uh, from minimum of 10 pounds uh, or maximum of 10 pounds rather to a maximum of 100 pounds. Um, and that was based on stakeholder feedback from the industry to try and get more ATCs, more alternative treatment centers to actually engage in third-party testing um, and uh, you know, improve uh, product safety uh, and, and accountability. Um, that decision was based on a review of regulations in other states uh, and uh, and uh, a review of the research we conducted for our own personal use cannabis rules, uh, which also uh, allows batch sizes in excess of 100 pounds. Um, I can I, I wanted to just let the commission know that there are states that do uh, allow for uh, batch size. Other states than us allow for batch sizes of 100 pounds and above, uh, and and that uh, um, it is scientifically sound and uh, and and also uh, still. It achieves product safety uh, and accountability for for patients. Um, uh, you know, I, I am hopeful that this achieves the goal of getting more ATCs to use third party testing, um, and uh, that it, it only improves the the public health and, and safety of this overall uh, the med uh, medical cannabis program. With that, uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Brown. Uh, Ms. Ogun, can you please announce the next agenda item? Next, we have the Public Engagement and Education Committee report. Thank you. We have a member from the member of the committee to provide an update um, to the public and the rest of the commission about their work. So I believe uh, Commissioner Barker is going to provide that update. Commissioner Barker. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we appreciate you coming to the meeting to learn more about the efforts and the updates that we have for you. Um, Commissioner Nash and I just wanna share a brief update regarding the statutorily mandated regional public hearings on behalf of the Public Engagement and Education Committee. Um, the, as you know, many of you know already, the CREAM Act states that the CRC shall host at least three regional public hearings throughout the state primarily to solicit public input about social equity investments and how tax revenue should be used and appropriated. Um, we are excited, uh, extremely excited to let you know that we will begin these hearings next week, uh, beginning Wednesday, March 2nd. Uh, the first hearing will be for the Northern region. Um, this, and that will take place, as I just said, uh, Wednesday, March 2nd. Um, the second hearing, will take place for the central region, and that will be Wednesday, March 9th. And the last hearing will be for the southern region, and that will take place Wednesday, March 16th. Uh, now, all hearings, in, in the interest of trying to get as many participants as possible, all hearings will be virtual, and they will take place uh, between the hours of 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Um, and you really just want to emphasize that the purpose of the public hearings is for you, the people, to share your thoughts and ideas and, and wishes for how tax revenue should be spent for social equity investments. Um, as, as we know, one of the driving forces behind legalization of cannabis uh, is the ability to use the tax revenue collected to restore people, uh, to restore families, and, and to restore communities most harmed by the failed war on drugs especially our black and brown people, uh, communities and families that bore the brunt of that. And so we really, really want to emphasize again that this is an opportunity for your thoughts, your ideas to be heard and, and prioritized for your neighborhood, uh, for your town uh, and, and for our state of New Jersey. Uh, and we do hope that uh, the legislature follows the recommendations from our report. Um, for more information, you can refer to our website, nj.gov backslash cannabis. Uh, and you can also sign up to register on the website. Um, 
We ask that you join the public hearing in the region where you live, uh, but we understand you may have a scheduling conflict. And if that is the case, um, you are welcome to join when you can. Uh, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to our office if you have any questions or comments. And we truly look forward to seeing and hearing from you very soon. God bless and take care. Thank you, Commissioner Barker. Ms. Hogan, uh, can you please announce the next agenda item? Next up on the agenda is the consideration of adoption of a universal symbol for cannabis items. Director Brown, can you please provide a summary of the um, staff's recommendations on the universal symbol for cannabis items? Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you to our public education committee for uh, putting that together and putting together those, those important hearings. Um, so, uh, Pursuant to the law and uh, corresponding regulations, uh, the commission has to designate a uh, universal symbol to appear on uh, cannabis products. So those are uh, cannabis items, uh, both uh, flower and uh, manufactured cannabis products that will be sold in the recreational market. Um, the symbol is to denote uh, that it is in fact a cannabis product. Um, at our November meeting, uh, the commission heard uh, public comment from uh, both the public and invited speakers on, uh, you know, best practices and considerations for uh, a, a universal symbol. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so some of the feedback we, we the commission received at that meeting were to use uh, symbolism, uh, you know, recognizable to a wide range of individuals, including children. Um, use it, uh, components that are utilized across multiple jurisdictions that's responsive to stakeholder feedback, uh, incorporate elements of uh, warning labels from uh, other industries. So, you know, there are many consumer household uh, packaged goods and products uh, that might be dangerous to kids, uh, and they all uh, tend to have uh, warning labels on them. And so, you know, looking at those to as, as the basis for what we do in cannabis is also important. Uh, and then also to include elements recognizable to, uh, to people who, uh, you know, it, like kids who, who can't read yet or non-native English speakers who, uh, who wouldn't be able to read a written message in, in English, use elements that are easily catch the eye. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so based on uh, review and work, and I want to thank our communications director, uh, Tony Ann Blake, as well as uh, graphic designers uh, at the state uh, office information technology who, who worked on putting together some options. Um, it, the, this is the, the staff uh, recommendation to the commission for uh, the universal symbol. Uh, and there are two here and I'll note why. So one uh, is for uh, packaging, uh, essentially to go on uh, the label of, of uh, the exterior of a package. Um, and this incorporates three elements. So first, uh, a red stop sign denoting pause or stop. Uh, the, uh, you know, a version of the international uh, intoxicating uh, cannabis product symbol, uh, which uh, uh, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation and ASTM International had presented at our, our last meeting, which incorporates elements from uh, other industries of warning labels and also uh, it uses the cannabis leaf, which is in uh, utilized in multiple jurisdictions now uh, to denote a cannabis product. Uh, and then it includes the plain, plain language warning, uh, not safe for kids. So that would be a uh, essentially go on the package itself. Um, a minimum uh, size of uh, 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 width of 0.75 inches and a height of 0.5 inches. Uh, and then there will be, if adopted, a corresponding style guide, which will uh, explain uh, how to scale that up depending on the size of package packages. We do have smaller packages that cannabis products can come in. And so that's why we're start we would start there and then, and then scale up uh, accordingly. The second is a product imprint. And, and per the, per the law, uh, the, the universal symbol is to be imprinted uh, directly on uh, cannabis products. So uh, edibles, ingestible products uh, will need to be imprinted with this symbol. Uh, and here um, we're just, uh, the recommendation is to just use the simple uh, warning triangle with the cannabis leaf as that imprint. Um, the, Im the imprint 
piece would be the more uh, costly uh, to implement for the industry. And so if we keep it simple uh, and keep it, uh, you know, something that's that's potentially usable in multiple jurisdictions, I think that can be helpful. Um, so uh, if you move to the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, this, as I said, it incorporates a version of the international intoxicating cannabis product symbol, which was presented at our, our last meeting and adopted by a standards organization. It's not exactly to their specifications because it's in this uh, additional format. It includes the cannabis leaf. Next slide, please. Uh, and it incor incorporates those other elements we talked about, uh, commonly known symbolism to denote stop or pause, plain language that says not safe for kids, and it's, it's only three colors, uh, and so cutting down on, on costs of, uh, uh, of printing these uh, to appear on labels. Um, so that is the, the recommendation. Uh, I'm confident that this is a uh, you know, result of uh, hearing from those stakeholders, uh, moving with back best practice and uh, making sure uh, our universal symbol is, uh, is reflective of those things. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Brown. Do I hear a motion on this matter? Madam Chair, I move to adopt this resolution concerning the universal symbol that indicates that a cannabis item contains cannabis. Moved by Second that, Madam Chair. Chair. Moved by Commissioner Del Coso and seconded by Commissioner Barker. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, Ms. Hogan, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Aye. Commissioner Delsid Coso? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Chairwoman Wainu? Yes. The motion passes. Next on the agenda is the consideration of medicinal cannabis product waiver regarding concentrates. Director Brown, can you please provide a summary of this uh, proposed waiver and its need? Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, right now under medical cannabis regulations, uh, license permit holders can produce um, topicals, uh, lozenges, uh, oils, which can be either in a vaporizable form uh, or in uh, in like tinctures, um, as well as as whole flour. Um, here, uh, what we're proposing is to provide a waiver uh, of uh, those limitations on products uh, to specifically allow for a, a category of products for which we have a number of uh, product proposals. Uh, and uh, we've heard from both industry and patients uh, alike uh, as to the, the want for these products uh, in, in the state of, uh, of concentrates. Uh, so these are things uh, essentially uh, pure forms of either solid or semi-solid uh, cannabinoids um, that are extracted from the plant. Um, generally, they are not uh, there aren't excipient ingredients added, uh, like you can see in, in uh, vape cartridges. So these are things that go by terms of wax uh, or rosin uh, or, or uh, uh, shatter um, and other, other names. Uh, they are available in other Northeast medical markets, available in medical cannabis markets uh, across the state. Um, and we have an opportunity to, to make them available here uh, in the state of New Jersey. Um, importantly, uh, for a patient who uh, you know, might want a fast acting uh, uh, product uh, who doesn't want uh, flour, doesn't want a vape cartridge, um, this could provide a very uh, high dose, high and effective dose of cannabinoids in, in you know, one inhalation. Uh, so uh, recommendation is to approve this waiver. Uh, there is one condition uh, going back to third party uh, testing. So uh, in order to take advantage of this waiver, we, we, uh, we will only approve ATCs to uh, manufacture products under this waiver, uh, provided uh, that they engage uh, a third party lab to do their, uh, their product testing. So our recommendation is to uh, approve this, uh, uh, this resolution. Thank you, Director Brown. Do I hear a motion from uh, one of my commissioners? Madam Chair, I move to approve the product waiver regarding concentrates. And, and I second it, Madam Chair. Moved by Commissioner Nash and seconded by Vice Chair Delgado. Is there any discussion on this motion? Madam Chair, briefly, uh, yes, uh, before, I vote, uh, before I vote, I would just like to say that I hope uh, my fellow commissioners uh, and Executive Director Brown um, 
I hope that we will commit to also working on a framework that provides a waiver for expanded edible options. Uh, I think our patient community and stakeholder community, um, they continue to emphasize their need to have expanded edible options that offer them uh, alternative and more suitable methods of medicinal consumption. And I, I, you know, I do believe that they stress how expanded edibles will better serve them and allow them to benefit in many ways. And I definitely look forward to working with you all on this. Um, Although there are some safety concerns, I do understand that uh, concentrates are a helpful option, uh, medicinal option for patients. And I hope we uh, continue to incorporate additional helpful options for patients. And, and with that, I, I yield my remarks. Thank you, Commissioner Barker. Um, I will give uh, Director Brown an opportunity to respond um, if he so wishes on um, the ability of concentrates um, to be used in ingestible items. Um, and, but um, I'll also note, before I turn it over to Director Brown, I'll also note um, that uh, the commission does plan on updating its regulations within the medicinal uh, space through our formal rule proposal following the APA process. Um, so uh, I think we do, I think there is plenty of room for the commission to do that work and make sure that we are providing uh, patients with a wide variety of products that so that they can determine what is most useful for, for their medicinal needs. Um, so I'll leave it there, but I'll turn it to uh, Director Brown to see if he has anything to add in response to Commissioner Barker's um, comments. No, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I'll just echo your remarks. I think, you know, we will work towards that goal. Um, I think it was as we've discussed, there's some complexities when it comes to commercial kitchens, but co confident we can we can work through those, um, and uh, you know no issue there. So um, yes, uh, absolutely, uh, we'll you know we our goal is to continue to work to offer more products to to patients. Madam Chair and Executive Director, thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this matter? Hearing none, Ms. Hogan, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Aye. Commissioner Delsid Coso? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Chairwoman Wainu? Yes. The motion passes. Next, we have the open public comment period. The specific topic open for comment is on adult use consumption areas. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Uh, members of the public can submit comments during and after this meeting to the CRC in writing via our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. The deadline for submitting written comments to the commission is 5 p.m. tomorrow, Friday, February 5th, 25th. Uh, written comments, as always, will be shared with the commission members and will be made public along with the meeting minutes. We will hear from those. So we will hear from our uh, select invited speakers first. And then we will open up the floor to the broader public to provide their comments. Um, and we'll hear from those individuals in the order um, in which they have signed up to speak. So for our speakers this afternoon, um, please remember our uh, standard um, three minute rule. We have, uh, we'll have invited speakers who um, we have offered five minutes to speak. Um, but for the uh, public comment period, um, you will be limited to three minutes. Please, so please be mindful and concise during your comments. Um, we have uh, a number of folks who have signed up today. And so we wanna make sure we can hear from as many individuals as possible. Um, please note that the public comment period is meant to give members of the public an opportunity to address the commission about matters that the commission should be aware of. It's not a space for people to simply market or advertise private businesses. So we ask that everyone keep remarks focused on matters that pertain to the commission's work or items that the commission should be aware of. Ms. Blake will call out the names of our speakers beginning with our invited guests. And then we will turn to our, um, our other members of the public who had signed up to speak. 
When it is your turn to speak, Ms. Blake will ask you to unmute yourself. If you are dialing in by phone, which I believe we have, or we had um, <clears throat> a few folks joining us by phone, you will need to press star six to unmute yourself when told to do so. Now, in order for our staff to unmute individuals who signed up to speak, your full name or phone number as it appears on Zoom must match the name or phone number you used to register to speak. So please ensure that your name matches the name you used to sign up. If you need to change your name on the Zoom platform, exit the Zoom meeting and immediately relaunch the Zoom meeting, which should prompt you to enter your name. If you are joining us by phone, the phone from which you are calling must match the phone number used to sign up. We will not be able to correctly identify you as a speaker if your name or phone number does not match what you use to sign up. So with that, I will turn it to Ms. Blake to first call on our invited guests, and then we will hear from the public. Good afternoon, everyone. Our first speaker is Suzanne Schick, Dr. Suzanne Schick, Associate Professor at the University of California School of Medicine. Go ahead, Dr. Schick. Hear me? Yes, hear we me? can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I work at University of California, San Francisco, and California opened their first what we call on-site on consumption areas. They're smoking or cannabis use lounges in cannabis stores or dispensaries back in 2018. And I'm going to be showing you some data from the air that we studied in these public uh, stores. And also California allows cannabis, cannabis consumption at special permitted events. And I've also got some data from our annual harvest festival. Can you advance the slides, please? So I'm going to be talking a lot about PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is airborne particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. This means that they are small enough that they penetrate all the way down to the bottom of your lung when you inhale. They don't get caught up in your nose or your throat. And they can be solid or liquid, but they're usually made of a mixture of chemicals and they are known to damage the tissues of the lung and can enter the bloodstream directly through absorption from the lung. And what's especially important about PM 2.5 is that even very low concentrations can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically heart attacks. Next slide, please. This is data from the Emerald Cup Harvest Festival, which is held in the Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. We studied in 2018, 2019, and 2021. Um, this is a 21 and over event, has a secure perimeter. And in the areas where we were, people, the attendees are allowed to smoke freely, and vendors also give out samples of dabs and sometimes vapes. Next slide, please. The majority of the smoking activity, of the consumption activity is smoking there. And we measured in 2018, 1,118 micrograms per cubic meter inside the vendor area when the background concentration outside, outdoors, was only four micrograms per cubic meter. In 2019, it averaged 172 micrograms per cubic meter when the background was only three. And last December, it was 383 on average when the background was five. Next slide, please. This is data from a dispensary that did not allow smoking, but did um, offer desktop flower vaporizers and electric dab rigs, as well as permitting the use of vape pens on the premises. Um, we measured actually around the clock for five weeks in 2019. And the average PM 2.5 concentration when the business was open was 84 micrograms per cubic meter. And the average when the business was closed was three micrograms per cubic meter. This paper has been published in Environmental Health Perspectives. Next slide, please. 
These are what the daily concentrations look like. The little tiny black bars at the bottom of each column are the concentrations inside the business when the business was closed. So that's from um, 10 at night, nine at night until um, nine in the morning. As you can see, concentrations varied a lot day by day, but they were consistently much higher than the concentrations were when the business was closed and also much higher than the concentrations were outdoors in the air. Next slide, please. Our next data is from a dispensary that permitted smoking. Um, we studied this dispensary not 24 seven, but in short visits where we actually went into the smoking lounge with people who were customers carrying our instruments with us in backpacks. We did um, nine visits, um, mostly between three and 7 p.m. And uh, the average particle concentration was 840 micrograms per cubic meter. And measuring at the same time as we were collecting in the dispensary in a coffee shop on the same block, their PM 2.5 concentration was four micrograms per cubic meter. Next slide, please. What this looked like here is different days. Each bar here represents 30 minutes of sampling. On some experiments, we went in and out multiple times. It happened that the dispensary installed a brand new ventilation system midway through our study. It did not appear to make a difference. Overall, there was a 12% decline in PM2.5 concentration that was not statistically significant. Next slide, please. So what does all of this mean? What is a safe level of exposure to PM2.5? Safe levels of exposure are extremely low. The US EPA's current threshold is 12.5 micrograms per cubic meter. The WHO recommends a threshold of five micrograms per cubic meter. And a lot of the PM2.5 con concentrations I just showed you are literally off the scale. And when the US EPA says that something is unhealthy, very unhealthy, or hazardous, it means that there is a strong risk that it's going to increase the risk of asthma attacks, heart attacks, and strokes immediately when people are exposed, as in when I say immediately, within minutes. It's also going to add to people's lifelong exposure to carcinogens. Next slide, please. So is secondhand cannabis smoke perhaps less hazardous than other forms of smoke like tobacco smoke or uh, ve vehicular pollution? Does, do the cannabinoids somehow make it safer or better for us, less dangerous? That's still an open question, but I'll just tell you that the THC concentration, even in a highly polluted environment, is quite low. When we go in and do these studies, we don't get a secondhand high, even in really polluted places. You have to literally have multiple people smoking in a completely sealed environment, like a car or a van, to get that to happen. And if there isn't enough cannabinoids in there to have any psychoactive effects, there is unlikely to be enough cannabinoids in a secondhand cannabis smoke exposure to have a therapeutic effect that counters the danger posed just by having tiny particles of any reactive chemical inhaling into your lungs. All you're getting with a secondhand exposure is smoke. Next slide, please. These are data, I'm taking a, maybe a little bit more time here because I'm also presenting data from another scientist here at UCSF. My colleague, Matthew Springer, studies the health effects of all different kinds of smoke using rats. And what he does is he generates the smoke with a smoking machine, dilutes it to a concentration that's similar to what people are exposed to in the real world, and then has the rats breathe it. And before and after, he measures the diameter of the rat's leg arteries and their ability to increase in diameter when blood flow increases. Once you lose this flow-mediated dilation, your uh, chance of heart disease 
and your risk of heart attack goes up. When you're exposed to tobacco smoke, you can see that 10 minutes after the exposure, your flow mediated dilation goes down. 30 minutes later, it recovers a bit. Exposed to the same concentration of marijuana smoke, your uh, flow mediated dilation goes down and it does not recover significantly at 30 minutes post. Exposed to just plain air, you don't see any effects on flow mediated dilation. This to me suggests that cannabis smoke has the same potential health effects in that it will increase risk of heart disease in people who breathe it. And this Dr. risk comes on immediately. Next slide, please. Dr. Sheck, you have two minutes. Thank you. In summary, smoking and vaping release masses of particles. Dr. Springer has recently studied cannabis herb, you know, just dry herb vaporizers and found the same effects on cardiovascular health. Breathing particles increases the risk of heart attack and cancer. I know that there's still a lot of controversy in the literature right now, but frankly, we are a long way from having good, large studies of people that accurately assess whether or not they're using cannabis, this, which makes it much harder to see health effects. Smoke is very difficult to control using ventilation alone. We didn't tell the dispensary to install the ventilation system. They just had it in one time when we showed up and it really didn't help. And smoking and vaping lounges really are not safe for the people who work in them. This includes people who smoke marijuana for you know themselves. Earlier studies with tobacco smoke where they looked at people who worked in bars before and after smoking bans found that both smokers and non-smokers had better lung health and fewer respiratory symptoms after a smoking ban. You're not getting away from the risks of exposing your workers as a business owner simply by employing people who already voluntarily smoke cannabis. And I also know from working in dispensaries that not all dispensary employees smoke. Some of them only use cannabis via other administration methods. So that is the end of my talk. I will be happy to answer questions um, later on in the chat if um, that's something that's possible, or you can contact me through my email. The managers of this um, public meeting can make that available to you. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Dr. Schick. Thank you, Dr. Schick. Um, before we uh, let her go and I'll turn to our, our next invited guest, I want to open the floor for our commissioners to um, ask any follow-up questions on the information Dr. Schick presented. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Schick for this presentation, uh, very helpful and informative. Um, one question that I thought of as you were presenting, um, and especially considering um, the interest in uh, cons cons consumption areas, uh, both indoor and outdoor, um, I thought about your example of the festival, and I was wondering, um, in consideration of, um, you know, prospective venues, but also in consideration of uh, communities and residents, both um, the host community and then neighboring communities. Um, were you able to track how far the smoke traveled and um, what levels, it, um, you know, persisted at those different distances? The data I showed today are all from indoor environments, but we have also studied some outdoor environments, just not a lot of them. Um, we've studied the 420 festivals in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. We've also studied some outdoor concerts where both cannabis and tobacco products were in use. You do see dangerously high PM 2.5 concentrations at outdoor events. If the outdoor area is not near anybody else's houses, i.e. blocks away, you are unlikely to see pollution of neighboring environments at levels that we worry about for health. However, if somebody has a consumption lounge 
in the backyard of their commercial property and it's right below someone else's window or if they're if the wind is blowing into someone else's backyard then you can see exposures that are risky and also very very likely to cause people to complain we do normally see lower pm 2.5 concentrations when people are using outdoors rather than indoors However, if you throw a roof on top of it and some windscreens, you're starting to look a lot like what's indoors again in terms of those very high, very dangerous exposures. So if you've got enough outdoor space, you can see effective dilution. But most commercial properties where people are going to be opening stores and dispensaries don't have that amount of extra space around them. So when we were looking at the 420 Festival in Golden Gate Park and we were at the outer edge of the fenced off area, we did see a slight increase in PM 2.5 concentration, but not enough that over time we would have been worried about it and not enough that it would have been high once it had made it all the way across and out of the park and places where people were living. Thank you very much, Doctor. Is that, yeah, you're very welcome. Dr. Schick, um, I was wondering if you could um, highlight approximately how long it took for some, these indoor or enclosed consumption areas that you studied for the, for the concentration of PM 2.5 to uh, return to those background or baseline levels. So different businesses have different ventilation settings. However, most of them are somewhere between half of an air change per hour and four or five air changes per hour. An air change is when you have enough clean air coming into a space that it represents the entire volume of an indoor space. So in those, so when, you know, the, when we were looking at the dispensary that allowed us to sample 24 seven, we would see within about an hour after closing, the PM 2.5 concentrations would be getting closer to the normal background levels, but it didn't happen right away. And the problem is that when you're firing up, you know, when you start smoking something or using a vaporizer, you're emitting a lot, a lot of particles and it's hard to control and it does take a while to go away. Thank you. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you very much. Any other questions from the commissioners? All right. And then thank you very much, Dr. Schick, for your presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Doctor. Madam Chair, can, may I continue? Yes, please, Ms. Blake. The first round of speakers, I will ask as you hear your name, please raise your hand. Mayor Duane Warren from the city of Orange. Uh, Mr. Kashan McKinley and Mayor Janice Kovach. If you are here, I invite you to raise your hand. We will start with uh, Mayor Warren. Go ahead. Go ahead, um, Mayor Warren, we can hear you. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, thank you for, for having this session and thank you for allowing us to present. I am the chairman of the Cannabis Commission Committee of the New Jersey Urban Mayors Association. And it's a collection of mayors throughout the state that have uh, similar problems that focus on urban areas and urban constituencies. And this is a matter that is very important to the organization It's something we've pushed for for a long time. Um, your issue now to uh, regulate consumption spaces, spaces is important um, as it deals with our workforce, our children, and places where we bring our families. And some of the things that we've asked you to consider are the rules and regulations that are imposed under the Smoke-Free Air Act in New Jersey, which basically deals with smoking of, of tobacco at this point and um, vaping as well. Um, to the extent that it regulates 
indoor and outdoor smoking. And with the added feature in this case of having some barrier that's gonna be sensitive to the fact that children may be in the space as well and could possibly inhale a substance that uh, legally they're not uh, able to do. Um, the other issues around mitigation and around clean air within facilities concerns us on several fronts, um, one of which we'd like the air to be cleaned or the uh, smoke mitigation to be handled in a way that's done rapidly to ensure the safety of the employees and the patrons, um, but also we're looking at the safety of our enforcement personnel as well, who may be on the scene to enforce regulations. And we believe your regulations should be in accordance with local municipal regulations. And perhaps there should be a compilation of what those regulations are, and that should factor into your rulemaking process as well. There should also be some guidance and training to our inspection staff, whether it be building inspectors or our local police, as to how that intersection is going to happen. Because there are health risks that are imposed upon our, our municipal personnel um, who should not be under the influence of uh, marijuana during, during the time that they are on duty. Um, but this could be something that may be unavoidable if they're in places where they have to heavily uh, regulate. And so we want to we want you to think about how we deal with those employees and those that safety as well. Um, and then in places where there could be violations of whatever the rules and regulations are, um, legally we should deal with what are the what is the quality of evidence going to be as we enforce the rules and regulations. Um, and it just ventures into um, how do we acquire the evidence? Uh, how do we, and whether or not uh, it's confiscated, what happens to the license of the business owner who is operating the business there? So those kind of more thor thorny issues ought to be properly laid out so that we can mitigate uh, any litigation that might occur and to make sure that our businesses can thrive in this environment. Uh, and then finally, there is a big push from all of the municipalities to have appropriate signage. And so I was happy to see um, that we've adopted the universal um, signage. Now that should be across the, across the state, certainly in our urban areas. The language on signs and the limitations and a copy of the rules and regulations should be something that uh, establishments should be required to post so that everyone is on notice as to what the rules and regulations are and what the limits are to um, the use of this now legal product. Um, with those issues, um, the Urban Mayors Association is asking that you consider them across the board. We certainly would invite you or have you invite us to a session that walks through these kinds of issues before this final rule, rule implementation. And certainly I'll work with um, our executive director, uh, Ms. Barbara George Johnson, to submit something in writing um, to guide your deliberations as well. Thank you again for having us. Thank you, Mayor Warren. Uh, do we have any questions from the commission members for Mayor Warren? Seeing no questions, uh, thank you again, Mayor Warren, for your time and your expertise. Next up is Mr. Kashawn McKinley, who is Director of Constituent Services um, for the city of, for Atlantic City. Mr. McKinley, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I want to speak on a few things. I want to start off uh, specifically about Atlantic City. Atlantic City is not our state's home to conventions. It's the East Coast Convention capital. Cannabis is an entirely new industry that will be driven by conventions. Atlantic City needs special provisions to capitalize on this marketplace. Standalone consumption lounges, both indoor and outdoor, are needed. Atlantic City needs the capability to provide large indoor and outdoor venues for consumption of cannabis, but unlike the consumption of alcohol. Locations like Boardwalk Hall, the Convention Center, and Baderfield should be permitted to host large cannabis conventions. 
Only licensed five retail dispensaries will be permitted to be portable or set up a booth or a table to sell cannabis. Atlantic City Special Events Office requires the authority to issue temporary consumption licenses or permits for festivals and other events. We understand that the states, the statute prohibits this. Given the unique characteristics of Atlantic City, this is, ex this is an exemption or that Atlantic City truly needs. Without such exception or exemption, Atlantic City will fail at meeting the demands of the conventions where tens, in many instances, tens of hundreds of thousands of visitors attend Atlantic City. I believe municipalities will want to curb incidents of DUIs for consumers leaving consumption areas. Municipalities will likely be surprised that find out that consumption areas are prohibited from selling non-cannabis beverages, which would include water and non-cannabis foods. Drinking water staying hydrated is one way that the consumers may sober up from a high after consumption. Municipalities therefore may have an interest in pushing for revision to the regulations to permit the sale of non-cannabis and non-alcoholic beverages or light snacks. These facilities connected to dispensaries should be open to the public and not require people to become a member or to make a purchase to consume. Lastly, I want to stress that the point of legalization was to right the wrongs, specifically against minorities by law enforcement. Prohibiting consumption areas only perpetuates the same cycles of abuse within minority communities. If it is illegal to consume in public housing and in public, then the cannabis is still illegal for an entire sector of our community. Being forced to consume in public puts them at risk of law enforcement interactions, which is the whole point of legalization, to, the, to reduce these interactions. Starting a statewide educational campaign pointing out the purposes and safety measures that will be imposed on consumption lounges, such as prohibit the prohibiting of serving alcohol. You also can limit the amount of cannabis product a patron can consume. Provide a free ride share to consumers with an agreement for someone like Lyft or Uber. And also create incentives designated for designated drivers who would not consume but would drive friends home, thereby earning loyalty points from a dispensary. Thank you guys. Thank you very much, Mr. McKinley. Do we have any questions from the commission members for Mr. McKinley? Hearing no questions, thank you again, Mr. McKinley, for your time and your remarks today. Thank you. Mayor Kovach, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Wainu, Vice Chair Delgado, and rest of the commissioners for inviting me to speak this afternoon on behalf of the League of Municipalities. Janice Kovach, Mayor for the Town of Clinton and immediate past president of the League. As the CRC begins the process of setting standards for cannabis consumption areas, we urge the commissioners to continue to recognize the strong role municipalities have in regulating cannabis businesses. The CRC regulations adopted to date have done a tremendous job in recognizing this and we thank you for that. Regulations regarding cannabis consumption areas must first and foremost consider the health and safety of consumers, neighbors, and the rest of the community as a whole. Regulations must also consider quality of life concerns for direct neighbors and community members. To that end, we offer the following suggestions. Regulations should require public notice and direct notice be given to neighbors whenever a cannabis establishment seeks endorsements for a consumption area. This provides an opportunity for those in the community to express any concerns they may have over such a proposal. Regulations should provide for a me mechanism that allows for the reporting of concerns or violations related to cannabis consumption areas. Violations will be treated with progressive punishment culminating with the loss of endorsement for a consumption area and for the worst offenses, potential loss of a cannabis operator license. Odor control is of particular importance as it can greatly affect the quality of life of those in the community. While it may be easier to control the odor for an indoor consumption area, Outdoor areas may not be so easy, easy to control. Odor is one of the biggest concerns and complaints local leaders and communities with legalized use have received regarding cannabis businesses. And while the CREAM Act provides that indoor consumption areas must only be accessible through an interior door after first entering the real retailer, it remains critically important that these areas have alternative means of ingress and egress in the case of an emergency. This is for the safety of patrons as well as for first responders. 
When cannabis is consumed at a location other than one's own, one's own home, such as in a consumption area, it is only logical that the consumer will need to travel to and from the consumption area. This is increases the potential for impaired driving. CRC regulations should require any facility with a consumption area to have employees trained in CRC approved training to recognize impairment. This is critically important to help prevent a consumer from getting behind the wheel while impaired. Any license holder looking to operate a consumption area must recognize their role and potential liability when serving consumers, similar to how the state's dram shop laws operate. Regulation should place the responsibility on the operator to ensure that any cannabis brought into the consumption area is from the regulated market. As the CREAM Act allows for bringing in outside cannabis into the consumption area, it is possible that illegal or illicit cannabis is brought in. For outdoor consumption areas, the CRC should provide minimum requirements regarding the height of surrounding walls, fences, or barriers required and reiterate a municipality's authority to go beyond these minimum requirements in order to obtain municipal endorsement. Although cannabis establishment license holders are prohibited from acting as a retail food establishment, there is no current prohibition that food be prohibited from being brought into the cannabis consumption area. We believe it should be left to the municipal discretion on whether or not and to what extent food or drink can be brought into the cannabis consumption area. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mayor Kevach. Do any of the commission members have questions for um, Mayor Kovach? Mayor, I have uh, one uh, quick clarification question. You had mentioned um, a, this is desire to see cannabis businesses have their workers trained um, to protect people, but I did not catch uh, what uh, kind of training you are hoping to see. Could you just clarify that for me? Sure. Um, we would hope that the CRC would provide training. So some, for, so, some form of training that uh, similar to what some restaurants, most restaurants should be doing with bartenders or any servers, you know, how to recognize someone who is impaired and then what the steps that should be taken to uh, protect the consumer as well as the, the business owner. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Anyone else have questions for Mayor Kovac? All right, seeing no further questions, Mayor Kovac, thank you again for your time and your comments this afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next five speakers on our List today are Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, David Rosano, Dante Bronog, Hassan Austin, Noah Fod, Hala Alamar. Assemblywoman Sumter, David Rosano, Dante Brono, Hassan Austin, Noah Fod, Hala. Alamar. I think that may be six, but if any one of those people are present, please raise your hands and I will call you. I see Assemblywoman Sumter. Assemblywoman, you may proceed. Thank you. And I want to thank the commission uh, for uh, all of their work to date. I am uh, testifying today as chair of the Legislative Black caucus in partnership with the Legislative Latino Caucus and the Asian American Caucus of the New Jersey General Assembly. That is 34 members. I uh, join you today to amplify the mounting distrust and shaken confidence our caucuses have in the creation of the new adult use cannabis industry. I was fortunate to sit through a good portion of your meeting today to hear some of the concerns addressed from the executive director and the chairwoman and from your committee report. So I will report uh, that back to all of our respective committees. However, we had scathing press articles detailing and outlining the lack of equity and apparent unfairness for the issuance of medical licenses through a competitive request for applications that necessitated our united efforts to ensure we have better outcomes for equity and fairness in the adult use cannabis awards. We're trying to engage every effort with the lens of equity and inclusion 
regarding adult use cannabis to yield the intended benefit of social equity to recompense communities that were most harmed historically. As authors of the establishment of the CRC, we were intentional with creating new opportunities for businesses and partnerships for individuals from economically disadvantaged areas of our state impact zones. We are imploring you to establish a transparent application process that accounts for MWBEs and disabled veteran status, as well as a process that affords the opportunity to cure any questions on the application within a reasonable time frame, explicit instructions on how to move from conditional license holder to a permanent license holder, and lastly, limit the barriers to market entry for micro businesses that include an overuse of mandatory technical workshops for new entries. As we know, time is of the essence and much work lies ahead of us. However, we must establish confidence in the regulations and equity in the awards and equality. There must be intentional steps taken as we move forward with the integration of medical license holders, which is less than a year away. The marketplace for adult use cannabis needs a chance to succeed and live up to its written mission. As the New Jersey Legislative United Caucuses, we will continue to monitor your work and amplify concerns as received for timely responses to remediate. We don't want time to pass with us not having a conversation on those concerns raised by the public. We are committed to working with the commission to ensure that all communities are given a fair fighting chance. I wanna thank you for this opportunity and you have a copy of my written testimony. Thank you so much, Chairwoman and Sumter for, for your time and for your remarks this afternoon. I'm very happy to have you join us today's public meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Blake, please uh, go to the next speakers. Again, I want to remind everyone that your name on this list, on the um, attendees list has to match the name that you have registered with. Um, I see there is Hassan, there is no last name. Um, Hassan, could you please say your full name for the record? Hassan Austin. Go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm Hassan Austin, managing partner of MTN Biz Development. Uh, we're a business development company and we work with New Jersey cannabis attorneys, cannabis doctors, real estate and insurance professionals, programmers and more to, to aid the public and private sector in their pathway to cannabis licensing in New Jersey. So we advocate for small businesses by providing pool services commensurate to their capacity, really to balance the competition. So we see a little bit, you know, happenings on our end. I just wanted to share some of the sentiments and hopes of inducing New Jersey municipalities to opt in the cannabis marketplace. Your reluctance is noted, but your involvement is needed. There are inherent challenges with entering any marketplace. However, if we work together as a public and private sector cooperative state, we can solve some of these problems on the local level. Multi-state operators, they pull up to New Jersey with balance sheets for scale and often infringe on small businesses. However, the guidelines crafted by the CRC are intended to guard against these occurrences. The CRC shifted the power to grow and develop the cannabis marketplace onto New Jersey municipalities. So with great power comes great responsibility. Municipalities should exercise their power and responsibility to ensure social equity is properly administered within their communities. MSOs can be very averse to small businesses without proper enforcement. Please consider enforcement within your ordinances that will promise fairness and safety. Uh, again, with great power comes great responsibility. Article coming out in Cannabis Insider next week, check for it. 
thanks again, CRC, for your time and, and keep up the great work. Thanks again. Thank you. Again, the, um, I'll repeat the names from that first tranche of names. David Rossano, Dante Brono, Noah Fode, Hala Alamar. If none of those individuals are present, I will move to the next set. Chirali Patel, Paul Josephson, Vladimir Castillo, David Fetter, and Daniel Cassell. Chirali Patel, I see you. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for putting consumption uh, lounges on the public agenda, because I know it really is a important and equity matter. And I really do appreciate the mayors for chiming in and giving their feedback, as well as the doctor who gave a presentation. I'm sure we all know, being in New Jersey with the casinos in Atlantic City, that we, and even in bars and restaurants, we're exposed to secondhand smoke that is a lot worse. And I think there is technology with clean, specifically with clean room technology that's utilized when uh, for microprocessors or semiconductor chips, which has the ability to get rid of a large amount of particles, including um, what the doctor was talking about. And so looking into those, the clean room technology, HEPA filters that are approved by the EPA that can be used in addition to ventilation, because it, it is known that ventilation alone is not enough to help with the uh, side effects of secondhand smoke. So uh, just mentioning the clean room technology and a lot of what I wanted to say was already said earlier, but I will say that in the in the current regulations, which I know are still not final, there's a, a sentence about prohibiting food and beverage sales with respect to the consumption spaces. And I think there should be a strong consideration to at a minimum allowing access to non-alcoholic beverages because uh, dry mouth or cotton mouth is a common side effect post consumption or inhalation of cannabis products. So the need to have just ac access to water really is crucial. Um, I believe there are studies done about when there isn't access to food and beverages at consumption sites, it can lead to individuals um, tainting. Um, so i happy to share that study with you as well. And then the other thing for um, just safety in general, as far as like other businesses, because I know that's something, you know, people don't want consumption lounges, but I think figuring out how the businesses can really interact and let them know that listen this is this is a this is an equity matter like the mayor previously talked about a whole population of people who do consume cannabis live in public housing section 8 housing and they risk eviction losing you know their livelihoods really just for consuming on site and so educating the community through public health campaigns about the need for consumption spaces why it's an equity issue and how we can safely do this together and i think there is a good amount of information from states that have gone on to allow festivals or on-site consumptions like Nevada and Michigan, where we can look to and, and pull statistics and data to really help us shape this to be the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll repeat the names again, Paul Josephson, Vladimir Castillo, David Fetter, and Daniel Cassell. Seeing none of those people present, I will move on to the next set. Ashley Castle, Jim Rice, Lincoln Gratton, Nate Reed, and David Nathan. Ashley Kessel, Jim Rice, Lincoln Gratton, Nate Reed, and Dr. David Nathan. I see Jim Rice. Go ahead. Jim Rice, go ahead. Jim Rice, going once. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you, commissioners and chairwoman. My name's Jim Rice and I've spent close to 25 years in the alcoholic beverage industry, eight as a C-suite executive and an alcoholic beverage wholesaler. And I currently own and operate a cannabis transport business in Ohio. I would respectfully request the commissioners consider again, Increasing the number of wholesale permits an entity may be issued from one to three. The primary fundamentally unique business proposition 
that wholesale distributors can offer as an efficient and effective warehousing and logistics solution, which requires strategically located facilities throughout the state. In both my professional and personal opinion, allowing the a single uh, permitted entity in Northern New Jersey, one in Southern New Jersey, and one against the Jersey Shore will not only uh, help the program achieve its uh, social equity goals, but create a safer, more diverse, and more successful adult use cannabis market now and in the future. It's important to note that uh, when states that currently permit wholesale distributors, which are California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and soon to be New York and New Jersey, none cap the permit holder uh, permit number for warehouse distributors, for wholesale distributors. The reason these states allow multiple facilities is just to create an efficient supply chain. And in this day and age of uh, inflationary costs on fuel and transportation, it's imperative to make the supply chain of the New Jersey cannabis industry as efficient as humanly possible. Also makes it a much safer business environment as delivery routes will require shorter transports for drivers and less cash accumulated as they make deliveries. Again, please consider increasing the number of wholesale permits uh, from one to three. And I certainly thank you for all your hard work and dedication to furthering the cannabis industry in the state of New Jersey. Thank you. I see Dr. Nathan. Go ahead, Dr. Nathan. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and honorable members of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and educator and for the past 24 years have maintained a private practice here in Princeton, New Jersey, where I live with my wife and our two children. I'm a clinical associate professor at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. And as many of you know, I'm also the founder of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation or DFCR. Regarding the CREAM Act, DFCR's expert physicians and scientists would be delighted to assist the uh, CRC in uh, ensuring the preservation of public health in, uh, uh, in, in dealing with this issue as we have in other jurisdictions where cannabis has been legalized. I'm unfamiliar with Dr. Schick's work, so I can't speak to the research she presented, nor to her characterization of dissipated outdoor secondhand smoke as being very dangerous. Uh, I would encourage the CRC always to look to multiple perspectives on public health issues as important as this. As the principal designer of the in International Intoxicating Cannabis Product Symbol, IICPS, I wanted to thank the CRC for its hard work in adopting a universal symbol for cannabis products made and sold here in New Jersey. While this is the first time I'm seeing the CRC's proposal, I'm delighted with the general choices you have made. Clear markings of cannabis products such as this are critical for preventing inadvertent consumption by children and adults alike, and uh, also sends a message of caution to consumers and non-consumers. And that brings me to one serious issue I'd like to address with the CRC, and that is the need for standardization of labeling generally and universal symbols specifically. I would urge, I would implore the CRC to ensure that New Jersey's universal symbol follows existing standards, especially consensus standards in the details of the design. The warning triangle U should be the actual IICPS that has been adopted by ASTM and other states. Previously legalized states adopted a hodgepodge of different symbols that have created confusion and use leaves of all different design. The CRC should not perpetuate this confusion by using the non-compliant cannabis leaf you presented today. Having studied botany, I can tell you that the leaf that you presented today is not a cannabis leaf. The fused leaflets with a short central leaflet is completely inconsistent with a cannabis leaf and characterizes other species of plants, including commonly occurring local weeds. So your decision to incorporate the IICPS into the uh, New Jersey 
uh, universal symbol and imprinted upon cannabis products is well supported by recent developments. Uh, Monta um, Montana has adopted it, ASTM uh, is um, uh, publishing the standard very shortly. Vermont and Alaska have also both proposed use of the IICPS. Dr. Ladies Nathan, I'm afraid that's your time. And only through adoption of this original design can the CRC sit at the forefront of the gold standard for can cannabis products, not just in the United States, but around the world. Thank you so much for your work, your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the next five, Ashley Kessel. No, I'm sorry, that was my last five. Russ Hudson, Molly Hartman Lustig, Joe Hernandez, Jessica Gonzalez, Christine Baba. If any of those people are present, I see Molly Hartman. Go ahead, Molly. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you for providing me this time to speak. Um, as it relates to consumption areas, uh, the statute specifically 24 colon 6I-21 G2, um, along with 24 colon 6I-35A 14B provides that entities holding cannabis consumption area endorsements uh, shall not sell any alcohol, tobacco or food as some of the prior speakers have mentioned. Um, in addition, NJAC 2C 35-10A, uh, I believe it's 46C, uh, discusses personal use of cannabis items. And in addition to the language regarding personal use in consumption areas, there's language concerning um, smoking, vaping, or aerosolizing of a cannabis items by, person, uh, by a person or entity that owns or controls a hotel, motel, or other lodging establishment um, in up to 20% of its guest rooms. Um, and while a hotel owner would not obviously be the owner, owner of a retail license because of the restrictions contained um, in those sections I mentioned and other uh, restrictions, um, I would like to see some additional language concerning guidance for designations of those rooms that are permitted for personal consumption of cannabis products, or alternatively, um, if such a designation is not required, uh, how a hotel owner stays in compliance with that 20% rule. I would also like to see some clarity as to whether those rooms designated for cannabis consumption uh, will be the same rooms that hotels may designate uh, for uh, tobacco use by uh, guests. And I think it's really important to permit not only hotel operators, um, to be able to distinguish these types of rooms, but for customers to be able to choose a cannabis room as opposed to a tobacco room. Um, with that being said, from a policy perspective, as Mr. McKinley and others, um, Ms. Patel stated earlier, Atlantic City is a prime example of a municipality that needs the ability for elastic um, and truly municipal based regulations related to consumption areas and the areas in which patrons are permitted to consume cannabis. A specific issue that I would urge uh, is consideration uh, for consideration when the regulations are reviewed is whether hotel uh, oper operators and owners may provide consumption areas for use of cannabis products other than guest rooms uh, with explicit language as to indoor and outdoor consumption uh, that would not be linked to a class five retailer license. Um, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, the smell associated with smoking cannabis in flower form uh, could create issues for guests in neighboring rooms. Um, require extraordinary costs for hotel operators to retrofit their facilities to mitigate those odors, and also a consideration um, of uh, families um, who are occupying rooms together um, and adults uh, who are permitted to consume not being able to actually use in those guest rooms. Miss um, Lustig, that is your time. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Gonzalez. Jessica Gonzalez. Hi, hello. 
Go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your efforts and all your hard work. My name is Jessica Gonzalez, attorney at Hiller PC and outside general counsel for minorities for medical marijuana. I ask that everybody on this call keep an open mind when it comes to consumption lounges, as consumption lounges are a matter of health, public safety, and social equity. Given the restrictions on where adults can consume in New Jersey, consumption lounges provide adults with a safe and private area to consume. This is important for patients and non-patients alike who may be lacking a safe place to consume their medicine, especially for those who live in federally subsidized housing and could be subject to discipline. In addition to health and public safety, consumption lounges will also alleviate concerns surrounding law enforcement as well, especially for communities that have disproportionately been targeted for cannabis arrest. Consumption lounges cut off the proximity between communities of color and law enforcement and provides for a supervised, secure, and safe environment. If there are those who are concerned with children inhaling cannabis smoke, wouldn't it make sense for towns to designate specific areas for consumers to consume to prevent public street consumption? By advocating against consumption lounges, municipalities are forcing its consumers to consume on public streets streets, especially for non-homeowners who may be at the mercy of their landlord with regards to their consumption. Additionally, for those who are concerned about how those will get home after consuming in consumption areas, may I remind those that many bars and clubs spanning across New Jersey all have parking lots for their patrons and have little to no oversight on how their patrons get home. To place additional obligations on consumption lounge operators to supervise adults leaving these lounges perpetuates the stigma on cannabis that we are seeking to extinguish. And in terms of consumption lounges, which I'm in full support clearly, my only question is whether the commission is counting consumption lounges towards the square foot for class five micro licenses. I've submitted this question a few times, so please let me know as this plays into an applicant's architectural plans. And further, slightly off topic, while I commend the CRC for its attempts to lower barriers of entry, we are seeing heightened barriers of entry on the municipal level. And while I understand that the statute provides municipalities with broad discretion, which falls outside of your authority, there is a lack of transparency. The lack of transparency, which I understand is also important to the CRC, um, I recommend the following to combat this. Establish a portal on the CRC website for municipalities to upload their most current ordinances to have a centralized location and mandate municipalities to upload and keep current their ordinances. We are seeing such a mandated procedure in New York, and if possible, it'd be helpful for the commission to establish a similar practice to make it easier to navigate for applicants and also to ensure that ordinances are being applied equally to all residents within their respective towns. That is all that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we see, I see Russ Hudson. Russ Hudson, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for your consideration. Um, again, my name is Russ Hudson. I'm a consultant with Canon Advisors, a cannabis consulting firm based in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm also the author of The Big Book of Terps, which is the world's largest scientific textbook about terpenes and flavonoids and cannabis. I have three points today that I'd like to address with the commission regarding our consulting work with New Jersey cannabis license applicants. First, there appears to be no requirement to submit financial information for conversion applications. The conditional application asks for an overview of the proposed financing, but the commission has been clear that financing does not have to be locked down for the conditional application. However, there may be an oversight here because the conversion application does not ask for any financial details. Second, does the CRC have or will it develop a pounds conversion rate? For instance, for micro retail licenses, you can only sell 1,000 pounds per month, but how are edibles, tinctures, lozenges, and other products measured in this regard? Finally, the regulations at 1730-8.1b2 list the requirements for the completion of a training course by all individuals who apply for a cannabis business identification card. Item B2 in this passage states the requirement that all applicants have completed a training course, whether from a license applicant, a license holder, or a third party that has been approved by the commission and provides education on, at a minimum, the following topics, and then the regulation goes on to list several training requirements. The question here is this, does the commission have or will it develop a list of these approved training courses and providers? Must the training conducted in-house by the applicant be approved by the commission? And if so, where is this process described? On behalf of New Jersey clients and applicants, we ask that this information be updated on the CRC's FAQ page or somewhere else prior to the opening date for retail applications on March 15th, as these points are fairly important for all of these applicants. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
The next group of names, Charles Gormley, Dr. Monique Hamilton, Ariel Mizrahi, Joanne Zito, Jimmy Farrell, Cheryl Murray Powell. That's Charles Gormley, Dr. Monique Hamilton, Ariel Mizrahi, Joanne Zito, Jimmy Farrell, and Cheryl Murray Powell. I see Dr. Monique Hamilton. Go ahead. Hi, I am Dr. Monique Hamilton and I'm board certified in internal medicine. I'm the co-founder and lead physician for the Dr. Moni Hammy Medical Center, DMMC in South Orange, New Jersey. The type of cannabis product a patient uses is dependent upon the patient's response to the cannabis product and what condition the cannabis is being used for. A bona fide patient-doctor relationship is essential to determine which products work best for that patient. Currently, the bona fide relationship is defined as, among other things, the physician has seen and or assessed the patient for the debilitating medical condition on at least four visits. The patient should consult with a New Jersey medical cannabis program physician to determine what is the treatment goal so a plan of care can be developed. As with conventional therapies, the patient may have to try different forms of cannabis to see which one is best at helping the patient reach the treatment goal. The patient should be able to choose from a variety of cannabis products, including concentrates, so the doctor and patient can determine what is right for that individual. I applaud the CRC in its efforts to make cannabis concentrates available to medical cannabis patients. I'm confident the CRC will continue to ensure New Jersey patients are receiving the best cannabis treatments available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Zito. Joanne Zito, go ahead. Joanne, Hello. go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joanne Zito and I've been serving as a board member for the Coalition for Medical Marijuana of New Jersey uh, for five years now. Um, I would like to, uh, th these uh, comments are off topic of the consumption lounges, but I would like things that I would like to make the uh, commission aware of. Um, Jake Honig's Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act provides that prices that alternative treatment centers charge for medical cannabis shall be reasonable and consistent with the actual costs incurred by the medical cannabis dispensary, and that they may supply medical cannabis at a reasonable or reduced price and even at no charge to those who've demonstrated financial hardship and that the team, the term shall be defined by the commission by regulation. I would like to know if this definition has been made and if so, where it can be found and if patients and alternative treatment centers have made use of this provision or have been encouraged to do, to do so. Uh, that some alternative treatment centers are proposing to destroy cannabis they've grown for the adult use market while still charging some of the highest prices for medical cannabis in the country is a slap in the face to patients, especially for those who find it hard to affordably access medical cannabis in the state. On that note, as someone who has been advocating for home cultivation for some years now in New Jersey, I am happy that the commission has stated that they want to work with the legislature on making such provisions legal. And given that, I wanted to make the commission aware that the Senate president Nicholas Scutari's legislative director, Harris Lawfer, told me in May of last year that in regards to passing legislation on the matter, that they are waiting on the Cannabis Regulatory Commission to set up regulations. And then in November, when I asked about this legislation, Harris told me that they cannot support legislation yet due to the commission's capacity to handle such regulation. While I know the commission is working as diligently as possible to achieve all the goals and provisions set forth by the Com Compassionate Use and Cream, Cream Acts, I don't think this is a good reason for leaders to continue to keep personal cannabis gardening an indictable offense or to not take any legislative action on the matter at all. The punishment does not fit the, the, the proposed crime. And I think a hearing where medical cannabis patients can be heard on the matter, especially is long overdue. I hope the CRC will help remedy that in some way. I would like to ask the commission for myself and others who may 
have the same issue about clarification, clarification on qualifying for priority status due to cannabis convictions. Um, I have a number of cannabis arrests for misdemeanors and felonies in various states over various decades. And although these arrests alone have been detrimental to myself and my family, I believe ultimately I only have one misdemeanor conviction. I understand. Miss, I'm sorry, Ms. Cito, but that is your time. Okay. Please utilize the submit comments in writing. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jimmy Farrell. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I, we can hear you. All right, thank you. So um, I, my name is Jimmy Farrell. I'm the staff manager for ASTM's committee D37 on cannabis. And uh, there's been mention of the IICPS today and its adoption by the CRC. And I just want to provide some perspective on what exactly goes into an ASTM standard being um, created and approved through our consensus process. So ASTM is an organization, uh, we're an international standards developing organization. We've been around since 1898 and we develop standards from everything from children's toys to airplanes and the fuel that go into them, as well as standards in the cannabis space. It was brought to the Committee on Cannabis, the idea for an international symbol by Dr. David Nathan and his son. And um, basically how that worked was they had an idea that they presented to the committee. The committee is made up of experts who participate from across the globe in ASTM's consensus process. And so they worked with a task group of members to develop this document, which um, has a designation for ASTM. It is D8441. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to be published on our website either in the next day or very early next week. Uh, it's very close to publication. And um, anyway, this task group worked to develop the content of this standard that was then put through ASTM's consensus balloting procedure, which is all members of the committee had the ability to vote and comment on this topic. And members of the committee represent people who grow cannabis, who test cannabis. There's security people, regulators, um, advocates within industry, patients, consumers, all people that want to be involved in any part of standards development are welcome and in the case of D37 do participate. So committee D37 has 1100 members and they all received a copy of this ballot and there were no negatives that stayed in terms of holding the ballot up from being published. There was unanimous agreement across the committee, and it is now entered into this publication space where you will then have the ability to specify exactly how this symbol can and should be used in relation to identifying intoxicating cannabinoids. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Next up, Cheryl Murray Powell. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheryl Murray Powell Esquire. I'm a cannabis agricultural dietary supplement and trade attorney. I've been in the cannabis space for six years. I'm also the business development manager for CSI, uh, a professional background screening association accredited uh, company that's been around for 46 years. My first comments are uh, with regards to the adoption of the international symbol for cannabis. I am on, uh, I, I sit on the ASTM International D37 Committee Executive Committee. I'm the chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee. And I'm also on a task force that met for the first time today to determine a subcommittee on cannabis banking, funding, lending, and payment processing. Um, congratulations, uh, it's a good decision to adopt the um, universal symbol. 
Um, I wanna support Dr. Nathan in his comments, as well as um, Jimmy Farrell uh, representing ASTM staff in his comments. With regards to the uh, consumption lounge discussion, um, I, I just want to echo the sentiments of um, attorney Jessica Gonzalez, um, who is the general counsel for minorities for medical marijuana. And I was the original um, general counsel for minorities for medical marijuana, and we're completely aligned on this issue. Um, it's very important that you provide safe spaces for people to consume com um, cannabis. Um, with regards to um, the inequity when it comes to um, economic standing in our country and, as, and in the state of New Jersey, it's really important that people have the opportunity to consume cannabis as is their right away from children. Uh, children are more likely to be impacted by cannabis consumption in a home rather than in a safe space. Um, so I think we should really uh, take that into account and provide these safe spaces for people who may not have the luxury of multiple rooms in their homes or home ownership. In addition, I just want to um, remind everyone that you know the uh, in Amsterdam they've had consumption lounges for decades and decades, and they haven't seen the issues that were asserted in the presentations earlier today. Um, so they have been able to safely consume in a social environment in safe spaces, and and those environments were um, created and provided to uh, residents of, of the community. Um, also, you know, when we're looking to distinguish cannabis from other methods of, of consumption and other products, I, I want to call attention to the fact that, you know, cigar lounges exist and have existed for uh, a long time, and we don't hear these types of concerns. So it's really important that discriminatory language is not used with regards to cannabis patients and cannabis consumers. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Madam Chair, that is our last registered speaker. Thank you, Ms. Blake. And thank you to everyone who spoke and shared their comments and thoughts with us today. Uh, this uh, it concludes the business before the Cannabis Regulatory Commission today. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion, Madam Chair. Moved seconded. by Commissioner Del Cid Coso, seconded by Commissioner Nash. Is there any uh, discussion on the motion to adjourn? Hearing none, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 All, the, all those opposed say nay. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you all for joining today's meeting. Please visit our website to view information about our upcoming meetings, as well as uh, information about the public hearings that the Public Engagement Education Committee is hosting uh, starting March 2nd. Um, please come out and make your voice heard. Um, we are very excited to, uh, to, to hear from the public. And so we really wanna encourage folks to participate in that. Um, our meetings will continue to be conducted virtually until further notice, and our next scheduled public meeting is on March 24th. The time is now 3.35 p.m., and we are now adjourned. Have a good afternoon and great evening, everyone. Take care. <laughs>